Hi there, global citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, coming to you with part two of my conversation with Akua Yinka. In case you missed it, and I encourage you to go back, Akua in part one talked about her experience that drove her into her works with the UN, as well as her local citizenship around the world. And just as a refresher, Akua is a polyglot and thought leader in international development with a passion for young people, health and innovation in sub-Saharan Africa. She has 20 plus years of international experience working for UN agencies, and she is currently an adjunct professor at the Center for Social Research in Health at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, where she has authored and co-authored five book chapters, numerous peer-reviewed journal articles, research reports, training manuals, and curricula on education, sexual and reproductive health, and health innovation. And in this episode, she's gonna tell us more about her forays into the art world. Let's start right there. So those are, and, that, and there's other boards, and then there's my artistic boards, right? So I'm a board member of Anogana. I'm very proud of that. That's uh, my most recent board. Um, Anogana, I'm sure many of you know, is Nana Oforiata Ayim's organization mm-hmm. based in Accra, and she's behind a lot of very important work that's being done in the art world, including biennales that are happening to this year in Venice, as well as in Dakar. It was a big exhibition on Ghana and art from Ghana in Dortmund in Germany that that Mm -hmm. kicked off in December and is still ongoing. I'm also one of the co-creators for the the program going alongside the exhibition, the discursive program. We're doing really fascinating things like uh, community walks where we're involving um, members of the Ghanaian community in Dortmund to show others you know, the African side of Dortmund. Mm. Uh, we're showing films by Afro-German filmmakers. We're showing films by, by Ghanaian filmmakers, such as Dr. Kwesi Owusu, who's going to show a film next week. We've done a radio program where we invited a young Gambian man who emigrated to Germany to do radio program. It's called Born, Born Free Radio, where he talked to other elders in the Ghanaian community about what it's like to live in Germany. So we're really doing some quite fascinating things, concerts, we're at workshops for kids. And that's been really an, a great experience. And with a lot of support from Nana, a lot of support from uh, Dortmunda U, who really committed quite a bit of funding to this program. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then, you know, once that's over, we move on to London, where the Encyclopedia of African Art will be presented and then to Venice in April and Dakar in May. So it's going to be a very busy year. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's two other boards. There's Hangar, which is a a similar organization like Anogana in Lisbon, Uh founded by one of my dear friends, Monica Miranda. And, uh, And then there's Savvy Contemporary, which is, again, the similar organization like that in Berlin where I'm actually the board Mm -hmm. chair. And then with Savvy, because I'm board chair, I'm able to do a lot of the linkages. So Savvy and Hangar are now linked to each other because we are exchanging radio programs and uh, uh, library books and publications and things like that. And then as Savvy and Anno, we'll be working together in Venice on an event, including uh, inviting African collectors and doing specialized tours and talking about future museum projects in Accra. So lots of exciting things happening this year. Okay, okay. So I want to take a step back and talk about the work you're doing in the sexuality space in Ghana and then back to the the art space. So you you are aware there's a hot topic now in Ghana that is around LGBTQ+, and then also around the sexual education curriculum and how children are being taught. And so is the work that you're doing kind of moving to make, because what what it seems like is happening is that there is like creating an ignorance amongst young people so that they are not aware of a lot of the the self, like you said, knowing themselves and things like that, like in terms of the sexual education, like what is written is like, what is this, right? And so are you working with the GES, Department of Education, on the university level? What what exactly are the mechanics that are going into moving the dial from this very, like you said, religious conservative space into 
let's really think about humans and what humans need to be able to navigate, as you said, and understand their, their selves and their bodies. Yeah, so this is a, it's a very hot topic and there's some things I can't mm-hmm. talk about publicly, uh, but let me course. just give mm-hmm. you my own take. So basically what we experience in Ghana is not unusual. I think a lot of African right. countries have experienced the same kind of gridlock. Mm-hmm. And so what is new and what I'm bringing to the table and through my colleague, Benedict, who kind of found me online and asked me, So, you know, what can we do is we've created an international kind of like advisory group of people like myself who've worked internationally or in other countries. So there's, you know, experts from Nigeria, from Kenya, from Uganda, from Liberia, accompanied similar struggles in other countries. Mm. And we're trying to bring strategies that have worked in those countries and apply them to Ghana. And so, uh, and there's actually quite a bit of work that's not published, but that's really expertise that lies within the consultants and the program managers that are doing this work. And we've really come together as a group for the first time this month, at the beginning of this month, and we're going to meet monthly where we bring together expertise and try to strategize, basically providing support. You know, Mm -hmm. what can we do in in creating communication strategies that will help the Ministry of Education, Ghana Education Service, Mm -hmm. address some of the issues of, you know, the the right wing. Sure. And it's really, it's it's about clarification. So I see two things. One, Ghana really needs to think about, you know, what are kind of the big issues that we are experiencing as a country right now pertaining to young, young people? One of them is mm-hmm. most certainly teenage pregnancy. Mm-hmm. The rates have gone up significantly since COVID. Another issue always is early marriage. So, you know, how is it that, you know, mm-hmm. young women are like, why does it still happen? Like, you know, early marriage is really an impediment to a young woman's development as a professional to become economically independent. And then there's also the most sensitive issue for me, it's not about sexuality, LGBTQ. It's actually about sexual violence. It's that it's about sexual abuse. Yes. It's about what yes. happens mm-hmm. behind closed doors and families mm-hmm. and what happens in uh, extended families, what happens in schools and how young women and men are basically experiencing violence from people they trust, yeah. from people who are their, their elders. And it is not spoken about. And that is also probably one one aspect as to why there's very high teenage pregnancy rates. You know, a lot of the the pregnancies that young women experience are not because of choice. Mm -hmm. They are because, you know, abuse plays a large part, especially for the very young girls. Exactly. And so so we really need to come together as a nation to say, what are the big issues we want to address? You know, what are the goals we want to reach? As in, you know, reducing teenage pregnancy, reducing early marriage, reducing violence and bullying. I mean, there's the violence, which is the most extreme, but there's also a lot of bullying. You know, there's also a lot of a lot of young men are bullied. Mm -hmm. A lot of young men experience violence in school. You know, there's still corporal punishment. And so those are the issues that all belong within the comprehensive sexuality education curriculum. And so I think once we establish these high level goals of what we want to achieve, then it's much easier to agree on the components of the curriculum. What is it that we need to teach so that young women are able to prevent pregnancies and have control over their bodies? Mm -hmm. How are they able to report sexual abuse? How are boys able to report, you know, being bullied and other being beaten up in school? And then you build the curriculum. And you do it together mm-hmm. with the religious right movement. Because I think one thing that everybody agrees on is that we want Ghana's young people to be leaders, to be healthy, to be able to, you know, have fulfilling lives. And if we withheld, withhold information from them, then they're not able to reach that. So let's agree on what we need in order to really make sure that Ghana's young people are, are Africa's leaders, right, of today and of tomorrow. Yeah, I like that. That's that's. That's wonderful. Like you said, it transcends just Ghana because it is a conversation that is um, continental and and it's yes, I like it. So I'm wishing for great things to come from from your work and your collaboration. Thank you. Yeah. And I do, too. I mean, it's really that nothing happens by chance. Right. So I'm really glad that my colleague Benedict found me. And that we're really able to like I'm able to rally a lot of the people that I work with at UNESCO Mm -hmm. 
a lot of my African colleagues to really come into this work. And everybody wants to do it because they want to learn about these strategies for their own country context. Exactly. And, and one more thing, actually, Florence, that is different is we're all African. Mm. So this is an advisory group that doesn't include European. I mean, some of our colleagues in the UN agencies are European, but this is really an African group because we also want people to know this is not an outsider issue. This is not an issue right. that, you know, Europeans brought, you know. Africa has always been, you know, African societies have always been very pluralistic, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of these ideas of the nuclear family and of man and a woman and two children, they, those are not African concepts. Exactly. We don't live in nuclear families. And so mm -hmm. this conversation mm -hmm. about diversity is a conversation about Africanness mm -hmm. because we live in families with multiple mothers and stepfathers and, you know, biological families, yeah. all in one pot. So that is the conversation that we need to have when we talk about the diversity. Don't focus on the sexual diversity. You know, that's that's one small aspect. But let's look at diversity that we're already living, that we've always lived. We've always had mm -hmm. female headed households where you've had two aunties raising children. Mm -hmm. You know, so why make it such a, you know, a hot topic right. now? You know, when yeah, it's always, yeah. always been part of our society. Right. And I love that you made the point that, there, that everyone is African on this. And that's it's very it's very important. And that's great. So now on to art. So you mentioned that you're part of these organizations and, you know, you've had this expansive life. And clearly as a consultant, you, you understood how to be a business person in that regard. And then you come to art. And art is its own business. And so I'm wondering if in some of in some ways that you've come to art, is it just the pleasure side of it or are you collector? So how how did this how did art become such a big part of of who you are in, in now? Yeah, so I'm definitely not involved in the commercial side, in the commercial side. Mm -hmm. So I started out as a very minor collector. I mean, I'm an art lover, always have been, and I really credit the German education system for making me that person. So I've been going to museums and my father, you know, he was dragging us to museums mm. always. Um, I had a very good, you know, foundational art education. And then I've just been a lover of art, always have been, and started collecting. And then once I started collecting on a very small scale and meeting artists, I, I realized that they are our philosophers of today because mm -hmm. artists are able to really address topics that, you know, we can't even articulate yet as societies, you know, so that to me, I've really learned so much about, you know, the decolonial thinking was through my artist friends, because they are, they have the freedom to really think and express it in ways that you won't be able to understand in a book, right? Mm -hmm. And so I really see my artist friends as the foremost thinkers, right? you know, right now. And so it's become more than just, you know, wanting to buy art and learn about art. It's really becoming an educational journey for me as well and, and an activist journey because, you know, artists like, especially mm -hmm. the African artists right now, it's, it's really how they position their work in, in history, you know, the, you know the, the importance of the Black figure in art, right? Mm -hmm. How femininity mm -hmm. is addressed in art, how colonialism is challenged, I mean, really greatly challenged in a lot of the artworks that we're seeing um, right now. So so it's become one of my passions, one of my kind of activist platforms. And my role is really about, again, bringing people together, about bringing funding into the space. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and kind of bringing any type of support I can, you know, through, like you said, the business skills I've gained as a consultant in the UN system and bringing a little bit of that business thinking of how can we create linkages? How can we share libraries? How can we share resources? Mm -hmm. and, and then also bringing people to the forefront that ne never had a voice. You know, that the most exciting part about co-curating the discursive program in Dortmund was really meeting this young man that I met through a workshop that was supposed to be a vi about violence against women and how men can be involved and meeting him and then inviting him and his radio program to the art platform, right? It's making these cross linkages and that's what's really exciting. Yeah, I can imagine. I can. So tell us, who are some of the up and coming artists that you are watching, seeing, just seeing rise with in the activist sense and just in the, the creative sense? 
So there's a Kenyan artist who I love. Her name is Renee, Renee Mboya. And for mm-hmm. me, like I've learned so much from her because she's actually a filmmaker. So through my ex-partner, what we were doing is we were trying to raise funds for his newest film, right, which was going to be set in Angola. And then my role working with him was how do we create a crew that is all African? Because we really wanted to create a film mm. that was, you know, truly African because, you know, especially when it comes to the cameraman editing, things are very, like, I think we have a different sense of rhythm, different sense of energy, different sense of, like, experiencing things. So it was very important that the crew is African. And so I started doing some research on to, you know, how can we find cinematographers, female cinematographers, African. Mm-hmm. And through that research, I found Renee. Mm-hmm. And Renee is actually not a cinematographer. She's actually a filmmaker herself. And she's an amazing, she's an amazing filmmaker, thinker. And she really, in her work, has tried to deconstruct this image that the West has of Africans, of African children running around naked and being hungry and you know, this very negative image that still exists till this day of of African people. Where did it come from? And she's traced it back all the way to a film that was created by Italian filmmakers in the 1950s. So she went back to that film and is now doing work around that, you know, around why it was important for the West to create these stigmatizing images of us. And then how can we deconstruct that? And that's why I love her work. I mean, it's really very philosophical and it's it's quite deep and she's it's very talented. Nice. Another, uh, there's, I mean, there's so many amazing Ghanaian artists. I mean, like, where do I start? <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> for example, um, I think she's called Kukua. She's also in the exhibition in Dortmund. It's another filmmaker. Okay. A female okay. filmmaker, and she did an amazing piece of work for the Dortmund exhibition on, on what we talked about on sexual abuse and violence, where she actually mm-hmm. interviewed Ghanaian women about their experience of, of having gone through rape or or even more sensitive incest. And um, and so it's fascinating. So so her film, I hope, will travel to other countries. Talks about that extremely sensitive issues, and even her own experience, I believe. Is part of sure. that film. Uh, who else? I mean, there's uh, Alan Atsui, who is like kind of the father of, of modern African art, uh, who is incredible. I love uh, the filmmaker John Nakampwa. Uh, he was yes. also in the mm-hmm. pavilion in Venice last year. And then Nana mm-hmm. has done something that is truly brilliant. And she has included a Brazilian artist as part of the lineup for the Ghanaian pavilion in Venice. And through that, she's really created that bridge of how yeah. us, you know, as Africans, that, you know, mm-hmm. our brothers and sisters, Travel. you know, yes. we are so connected. Yeah. And uh, I think his name is Diego Araujo. Okay. Um, and I okay. met him and his work is amazing. And to me, you know, with my history of Brazil and Portugal, that was quite special as well. To yeah. have, um, yeah. uh, to be proud, you know, to have a uh, Brazilian artist as part of the Ghanaian pavilion. So, yeah, so I mean, there's, I could go on and on. There's a lot of exciting work happening. There's a lot of figurative artists who are receiving a lot of interest, but just through my own personal history, I, I'm very wedded to film. Like, I think film is extremely powerful. And like I said, I'm mm-hmm. not a collector mm-hmm. for speculative reasons because I want my artworks to you know appreciate and value so i really collect with heart you know i really collect um sure. work that resonates resonates yeah. yeah 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 nice nice so that's great we'll have some show notes that have all of that included and so thinking of my next topic which is my mindset hack and this is where we want to know what is your favorite or innovative mindset hack so this is one that you can imagine or one that you know of. So would meditation be a hack? Like is oh it is. Yeah. So okay, so that's that's great. So I have a very strong spiritual practice. I think when we met in New York more than 10 years ago, or maybe exactly 10 yeah. years ago, I think we connected through yoga, right? So I've been yeah. a, a practice a practitioner of yoga for I mean, many years, like 12 years or something. But I've expanded now also into doing Tai Chi and Qigong. So I actually, oh yes, I start my morning with uh, Qigong. 
So every morning I wake up and I do a practice. Uh, I, I do a Qigong mm -hmm. practice and then I, I, do, I meditate. And that's how I start my day. So to be grounded. And yeah. also because I live in the city, so I'm actually not connected to earth. I do this practice outside. So right now where I'm living, I'm able mm -hmm. to do that practice in the garden. But like for me, as also I'm a Gemini star sign, it's really important to be grounded. So I have to do a lot of work, kind of like connecting to the earth, either when I'm doing mm -hmm. my practice or often in the afternoons, I go to the park and I just lie in the grass. Mm -hmm. It's an important part of really grounding myself to earth. And I'm really trying to I mean, what a lot of the artwork um, that I really appreciate is also about establishing our connection of nature's intelligence, something that we've lost, right? Mm. Living in, mm -hmm. in the Western world mm -hmm. and living mm -hmm. in this very fast paced world. You know, nature has so much to teach us. And so even though I am extremely modern and I use technology, I really try to have time where I'm, I'm connected to earth and water. Like I am, I'm a big swimmer. Uh, so in the summer, I, I really, I love being in the ocean. So those yeah. are my, the two elements that I, that I really need. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, we were definitely kindred spirits in that sense. And I just came off of a month all every day in January, I did Qigong. So I started my mornings with Qigong and I have a friend who teaches. So I was doing his remote class and then I would do my own practice. But yeah, I really appreciate that, as you mentioned, as a grounding and just energetic lift, right? And so speaking of the city, I live on the sixth floor in New York. And so in the winter, it's not easy to get outside and get to the ground, but I can absolutely feel you. So being back in Ghana, that's part of why I'm just so vibrating on a different yeah. level is because I walk outside into my garden yeah. and I can touch the earth every day. And so, yeah, I feel that, yeah. Yeah, so for, for folks, meditation and connecting, you said something very important with nature's intelligence because it is the all-knowing. And so, yeah, yeah, beautiful and wonderful. Um, so let me ask you, did you start to pick up the Qigong practice when you were in Asia or? Yes. Mm -hmm. So actually, this is another important topic. So I had uh, mm -hmm. fibroids, which I think a lot of African women mm -hmm. have. And, you know, I have my own thinking about that, why we have them. But basically, mm -hmm. I didn't want to go the surgical route. I really saw the fibroids kind of as a gift, mm. as a way to really dig deep into my family history. Why are they there? Mm -hmm. And what can I do in this life to make sure that my fibroids are not passed on to the next generation? Mm. Mm. Because this was also at the time when my nieces were born. And I'm like, I said, no, mm. but this has to stop. you know, And it has to stop with me. Like, I'm not going to pass this on to future generations. And so that was one of the reasons why I moved to Asia oh. because I was already familiar with acupuncture. And then I was able to get into the Taoist system and you know I've learned a lot of different things, but like I really, sure. Tai Chi, Qigong, like you said, those are really practices that I have resonated with me. And, but they're all derived from African knowledge systems, huh? Like, Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. And that is that is our my struggle daily. It's like I keep looking to the east, but I know that this is core yeah. here. Like it all started here. And I wish I wish if Africans understood the powers that are in our own soil and our own roots, then we would just be a phenomenal force. And I actually think that's part of the reason why we're not a phenomenal force, because others recognize that if we knew, where would we be? You know, we'll get there, though. Sorry. We will. Oh, I'm quite certain. We, we're on the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So we know you as the researcher and the board member. So tell us more about what you do aside from your meditation and Qigong in your leisure time. Are you a reader? Are you a watcher? Are you a listener? What do you like to do on your leisure time? Well, I mean, in my leisure time, so a lot of my time is also devoted to my, <laughs> my relationships, right? Because you know, that's the other challenge that we face in being so busy yes. and being, you know, professional women is that, you know, you don't carve out enough space for a romantic relationship if that's what you want to have. So, so sure. that, that, yeah. that takes up a lot of my time. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And then obviously, I mean, I, I, I look at a lot of art and I watch a lot of cinema, right? So I'm very, uh, mm -hmm. so culturally, I do a lot of things. So when I'm not exercising, like, you know, doing, yep. I do also do daily walks. Like I, I'm currently doing a challenge of 
doing um, 9,000 steps a day. And that's really helped me to really, you know, leave my desk. I'm like, okay, I have to reach my goal today, right? It's really helped mm-hmm, me mm-hmm. actually kickstart, you know, daily, not just like I would do before on weekends, like daily, I go out there and I walk my rounds. Um, yeah. So when I'm not yeah. meditating, doing to jiggle or exercising, I'm either spending time with a partner or, you know, in a museum, uh, watching a film, <laughs> reading or eating, which is my other passion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to eat. So what are some of the, your favorite films lately? That's a loaded question for somebody who dated a very successful filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> as diplomatically as you can um, let me just say so obviously his films will have to come in there so he, so my ex-partner he he really produced one of the most beautiful films i've ever seen called um our madness so by mm. joao viana um that's okay. the film that uh, brought us together so that's probably okay. number one um Mm-hmm. Another beautiful film. So the woman I mentioned who is the founder of Hangar, and uh, mm-hmm. she's just working on a beautiful film that will be shown in the in the Berlin Biennale. I'm not really allowed to say mm-hmm. anything about that yet, but so there's a beautiful film coming out by her. But she's done other beautiful films. And so Monica and I reconnect to each other because she as a filmmaker, she explores the theme of twins. And, you know, I'm a Gemini. Um, so we mm-hmm. often say, like, when we met, we were like, oh, you're my long lost twin. But not, I, I mean, that was a joke, but she actually explores uh, twins in her work. So look up her work, Monica de Miranda. Um, she does beautiful okay. work. She's Angolan Portuguese, exploring the role of women and the symbolism of twins. Um, I love her work. What else? So other films that I've seen, let me think if I've seen any commercial films that I've really enjoyed at the thing. Let me just say that I've watched the Netflix series on the um, Underground Railroad, um, okay. Barry Jenkins. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It is extraordinary work, mm-hmm. but it was very hard for me to watch. I think that energetically, yeah. I was not able to go beyond the second episode because it was so destroying, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah. that's only a testament to how amazingly well it was filmed, right? Sure. Oh. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I've heard that too. And I, I have, I have stayed away for, for that reason up until, you know, people keep saying, I'm like, yeah, I gotta, but I have to, I have to be ready, you, have to be ready. you know, cause you it have is. To be ready. Yeah. And, and I think through my Qigong practice, I'm so sensitive that I felt the energies so strongly mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I literally, I could not continue because the greed, you know, that is the basis of slavery and capitalism mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. inhuman. Mm-hmm. It is inhuman exactly. to treat another being, to degrade another being to that extent. Um, and to, to watch yeah. it is really, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really, yeah. you ha- you, it's hard. So maybe it will take some time to get to the end. But um, right. Right. yeah. But in sip, yeah. Actually, now <laughs> that I'm saying that, you know, another book that very much inspired me is Homegoing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who mm-hmm. I, I have mm-hmm. the pleasure of meeting, yeah. She did a residency mm-hmm. in Berlin and she also met Joao when Joao and I were together. And her book has mm-hmm. has even helped us really think about our family history because sure. my great-grandfather sure. was a Scottish slave trader. I can mm-hmm. say that my mom would hide that fact for a long time, but I just say it because like, what do I have to lose? Mm-hmm. You know, my, my great, right. my grandmother uh, is, you know, she's mixed race, you know, she's half Scottish, half Ghanaian. So like, you know, who was this man who came to Cape Coast? And uh, and there's no other reason that he would have, you know, stayed in Cape Coast other than be involved in the slave trade. And that's just, it's part exactly. of our history. Yeah. And I think that we Africans, particularly here in Ghana, you know, some Nigeria, but uh, definitely along the Western coast, we have colonialism as our, you know, our relationship with Europe, but we also have the pre-colonial, you know, African colonial colonization. We have that as well because there's so much history. There's that history. I too am part Fonti. So, you know, if you're a Fonti and you are here, then there's something that your lineage was involved in, in some kind of way. Right. And so, you know, just it's, it's something that we as Black people probably should start to have more dialogue about and just finding more understanding amongst ourselves just to even piece it out. Right. Because I think that's a little bit of the heavy 
and the misunderstanding between Black Africans across the diaspora. So, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I, I love that book as well for that for that reason. I was like, oh, yeah, OK, something to think about for Africans. It was so. hard, right? It was hard to acknowledge. Yeah. That, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's funny because a Black American friend of mine from high school sometime last year actually confronted me about it, you know, when I was like, oh, but you should be proud to be Black African. And, you know, it was part of this Eidos movement or he was saying some, some someone said, I don't want to be called an Af- or a Black person or African-American or whatever. I'm a person of distinction because some white guy had said, I'm going to call Black people people of distinction for whatever reason. And I said, Black is so much more powerful. Like, why would you just not want to be a Black person? He says, oh, that's easy for you to say when your family was selling mine off to come yeah. to the U.S. And I was like, oh, yeah. OK. So that is and I couldn't understand why there was this this this, this reason. And then a part of it is a reparations piece, but it is there's still scars, you know, and sores and wounds that have not been healed. And so we got to heal somehow. And part of that is us healing ourselves and being more deliberate about the return in a different kind of way. Because I think we didn't really address that in the concept of the year of the return. We just said, come back. And I think there's needs to be a little bit more of the understanding of who we are and who we are coming back to. So. Agreed. Very important yeah. work. But the, the great thing is that we, our generation, were able to talk about it. Like, where's my mom? Would hide yes. the fact that my exactly. grand, great grandfather yeah. was yes. you know, that person. I'm like, I just say it. Yeah. You know, I also have Scottish right. family, like probably cousins. I haven't looked them up yet, but you know, <laughs> it's a reality. Right. You would, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's true. You're right. This, our generation, I feel like our generation is slowly coming to ourselves as a leadership class. And I just hope in the next two to three years, we actually really embrace it and do much a much better job of taking over the reins as others have, because we're, we're, you know, what are we, Gen X? And we, we're, we're good with this business and, you know, kind of, we got the greed concept pretty well, <laughs> but we've got to transcend that into something that's a little bit more productive. And so let's hope Let's hope. Let's be there. So I'm so happy to have hosted you. Cool. That's so nice. And I'm just looking at love your smile. I'm just so happy that we're we're able to connect after all these years because it's been a it while. Been, yeah. 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 So before we go, do you have any last words for our listeners? Last words? I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, I'm here at this point in life. I was born in Germany, a country that I don't feel very connected to, but to very proud, uh, intelligent and strong African parents. I, I, I can only say that I feel so fortunate and privileged to be an African woman. And I, mm. I feel so proud of my color, of my hair, of my heritage. It's really Maybe it's because I didn't grow up in the U.S. or in Ghana. Like I've never had any of those issues of trying to be lighter or of trying to straighten my hair. I really feel so much pride in, in who I am and the way I look. And I, and I hope that that can be the norm, you know, for, for a lot yes. of young women in the future. Because, uh, I mean, I'm, I always tell my nieces, I'm like, our hair is so amazing. It keeps us warm. We can do so many different hairstyles with it. It's so soft, you know, it's like a pillow. It's like, it can protect us. It, you know, we can tie it, we can make it big, we can make it small. And that's how they really, you know, gain so much pride in their hair, you know? Yeah. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. just good for you. More women who really like, like I, like I choose the darkest skin color for all of my emojis. Because black is beautiful. right, me too. I'm, you know, I'm so beautiful. I'm so proud of who I am. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. Well, those are great last words. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, you have a beautiful rest of your day. And listeners, this has been another episode of the podcast. You can catch us with new episodes on Tuesdays at localcitizenspod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Please share, subscribe, like all those good things that help people find the podcast, write us a review, particularly on Apple Podcasts, if you listen there, so that people can find this great content. So until next time, listeners, bye for now. <laughs>